two of you on back there. My name is Charles King, and I have the uh, pleasure of serving as the Vice President for Institutional Advancement here at Philander Smith College. So on behalf of our President and COO, Dr. Roger Bell Smothers, Jr., who at six, three hours ago, called and said, Charles, I've been called by legislators. I can't be at the Quad Park tonight. I have something for you to say. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to bring greetings on his behalf. And doing so, I'd just like to welcome you to one of the city's most historic institutions of higher education, Philander uh, Smith College. This year, we're celebrating our 145th anniversary. For 145 years, we've been a lighthouse of learning, not only in the greater Little Rock area, but across Arkansas and throughout uh, the country. Uh, our designation as a historically black college or university, or HBCU, uh, in this nation. Uh, that's evidenced by uh, a lot of people in this room that uh, I know are alums of Philander Smith College. And I see Reverend McAdoo there with his hands full and several others around the hall. <laughs> and I'm going to take a moment that's not on my script <laughs> and ask the uh, Philander Smith College alumni if you would please stand. Uh, Patricia Blake, the executive director and our sponsor for uh, leading this conversation on public art and the Scipio Africanus Jones portrait. Uh, thanks to all the other partners, the Dunbar Neighborhood Association, Historic Neighborhood Association, uh, Hearn Fine Art, uh, Bethel, AME, commonly called Big Bethel, uh, as well as our friends at Shorter College and a little farther over, before you cross the river, the Central Arkansas Library System. Uh, and we would be remiss uh, if we did not thank the person whom I've met just this evening, the very brilliant uh, artist, Mr. Wade Hampton, who you'll hear from. <laughs> I had the opportunity to be reunion this evening with Attorney Gill. Uh, thank you for your work. Uh, to make the art installation possible. Uh, and also Mr. Thompson, uh, we're so appreciative of all the contributions of the Central Arkansas Library System to our community. And just down from them on the front row uh, is our former congressman, uh, Vic Snyder. Thank you, Vic, for joining us tonight. <laughs> the uh, post office on Main Street named in honor of our alumnus, Scipio uh, Jones. I don't know if any of you knew, but while he was not a graduate, uh, Mr. Jones attended classes at Philander Smith College, which was then known as Weldon Seminary. I also want to recognize the staff members from Congress French Hill's office, uh, who is certainly no stranger to Philander Smith College. Congressman Hill has done a fantastic job picking up uh, the trails of which Congressman Snyder laid to make sure that Philander Smith College and those who support it are always uh, on point. So thank you very much, Congressman Hill. And last but not least, I want to acknowledge one of my staff members, uh, Mr. Glenn Sargent, uh, one of PSC's uh, resident historians uh, and preservationists uh, for working to do all that you do uh, to make this even possible on our campus. Uh, Dr. Smothers had a story here that he wanted me to share that uh, back in 2021, one of our former uh, trustees, Mr. Rush Harding, uh, and his wife Linda said then that they wanted to uh, honor Scipio A. Jones. And in doing so, uh, they made possible a $25,000 gift to help fund the commissioning of the portrait of Scipio A. Jones. Uh, that will be painted by Mr. Hampton. Uh, Mr. Harding and Linda are not here tonight, but if you would, let's just give them a show of appreciation. And so it's fitting that this particular preservation 
uh, conversation uh, be held on this campus here at Philander Smith College. So without taking a lot of your time, because Chris has told me again and again, we have a heavy packed program tonight. We want you to know uh, it will be interesting and all provoking discussions tonight and that uh, we're delighted to be a part of this and it certainly illustrates the camaraderie, the friendship, and the need for community between Philander Smith College, the Claw Claw Association, Dunbar Historic Association, and all of the other partners that are gathered in this very eclectic and diverse room tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for your wonderful welcome. I'm going to do a little bit of fixing up here, moving us back to the beginning of our presentation. Um, for those that I haven't met, I'm Patricia Blick, Executive Director of the QQA, and I am so pleased to have you here tonight. Many of you met uh, my counterpart, my one and only colleague um, at the office, Shelly Stormo. She checked everybody in. Are you talking to her? <laughs> And I also want to recognize several of my board members that are here tonight. The QQA's mission is to preserve Greater Little Rock's historic places, and we want to say all of Little Rock's historic places. So we are thrilled as well to be here tonight at this historically black college and university. Um, so please wave your arm when I call your name out. David Robinson is my president of the board of directors. He was serving wine um, in, in the uh, eating area there. Ann Ballard Bryan is my vice president for education. Gina Silva, our treasurer, is, I know she's here, there she is. Um, Richard Steinkamp also was helping with the wine. Callie Williams, as well, is here. And Chuck Quiet on the other side of the room. So, I encourage you to talk with myself, Shelley, or any of my board members if you have questions about the priorities of the Qualcomm Quarter Association. Again, thank you very much. I'm sorry that um, President Smothers couldn't be here, but we did appreciate the wonderful remarks you presented, um, Mr. King. I wanted to also recognize a few other, I think, staff members that are here. Is uh, Dr. Um, Schamberger here, Chief of Staff? I think she was going to try to make it. Um, and then absolutely, I want to thank um, Glenn Sargent as well. As I said when we came in, he probably wishes I didn't have his phone number because I called him a lot and he was just so helpful and made this a wonderful evening tonight. And then again, I'm going to reinforce the um, partners for tonight's program. Um, Angel Burt is here. She is the director of the um, Dunbar Historic Neighborhood Association. And I just want to let you know, we're collaborate, collaborating on a couple of different things, but she's the one who made the connection, actually, I think, with Mr. King initially um, to make this happen, and then we've just carried on through there. Um, Garbo Hearn with Hearn Fine Art. Um, was our link to Mr. Hampton, frankly. When we talked about doing this, she set up the communication to, to make this happen. Shorter College is Paula Pumphrey here, the Director of Community Outreach. I think she was going to try to make it tonight. Um, and also uh, Bethel AME as well, and then the Central Arkansas Library System. We're thrilled to have Colin with us on the panel tonight. And I also wanted to acknowledge the Arkansas Humanities Council. We got a grant from the Humanities Council, and quite literally that is what gave us the funds to bring Wade here tonight. So as part of that, with, with uh, money comes strings, and we have given everybody a post-event summary um, evaluation. So if you could complete that at the end and give it back to us, that helps us um, reconcile the, the public funds that we got for this program. So we would, we would appreciate that. And again, we are a membership organization. If you're not a member of the QQA, you can join for as little as $35 a month. Go to quapaw.com, and we can set you up or give Shelly a call. So just want to put that out there as well. Thirty. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, thirty-five dollars a month would be okay too. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Minimum thirty-five dollars a year, but uh, if you want to be thirty-five dollars a month, go for it. You would love that. You would absolutely love that. That's funny. Um, I wanted to invite before we before we start with the art part of this program, I wanted to invite former Congressman uh, Vic Snyder up because he is the one who got the building name in honor of the city. <laughs> Well, good evening. It's great to be with you here. I think my job is the referee at the beginning of the basketball game that throws the ball in the air and then gets the hell out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is set up for our, for our 
our panel. I, I, when Garble called me uh, a few weeks ago and asked me to do this, it was an easy decision for me to make because I always do what Garble says. Uh, but I, I just think it's great that the work that you all have done now through the decades as an organization, and uh, I, I, um, I'm so appreciative. In fact, I'm appreciative of this many people being in this room tonight talking about these issues. I think it's a great organization. I, I don't remember when it was I first heard the name, you know, Scipio Africanus Jones. I mean, it's an unusual name. You think you'd remember it. I don't remember when it was. It may have been when John Graves had his book out, I think, in the late 80s or 90s. Uh, he and I did a tour of the Mosaic Templars building before it was ever picked up to be remodeled. And of course, we had the fire of it. But somewhere along the line, I started learning about Sidney Jones, and then, of course, when Chris Stockley did his book about the, the Elaine Massacre. But at some point, um, my staff and I, we decided that we would pursue naming a post office. So the first question was, well, which post office? And so I went to some historical types. I don't know who it was, maybe the Butler Institute or somebody. Where did Sidney Jones live? Well, that rascal moved around quite a bit. So I had this list of addresses, and I drove around. One of them had been... I think Wright Avenue was widened or something, and that one was torn down and drove around. But of course, the one he's most associated with is the one that needs a lot of work right now, 1872 Cross. It was mm -hmm. a beautiful home. It was actually built in 1928, so after the events, well after the events of Tulane Massacre, but he and his wife lived in there for a, a long time, and I think he actually passed away in that home. And that seemed the one that I ought to find the post office, you know, closer to that, which is how we ended up with the... the, the the post office on uh, Main Street. So George Bush signed the bill, and then a few months later, we had this really nice reception uh, down there, just to name on the building. And there was a nice, or still down there, a nice little plaque that names it. His granddaughter Hazel Adams was down from I believe it was Chicago. It was just a, a very wonderful event just to have this man uh, recognized for it his contributions to Arkansas under great adversity. And towards the end of the event, the place had kind of cleared up. You know, the post office bills don't get a lot of attention, so I stayed there until the last person left the post office. Well, the last person I talked to was the local postmaster, and I said something like, well, I suppose you're going to put up like a, you know, got a nice plaque, but maybe a picture or something, because he's such a dapper man. You know, such a dapper man, nice, there's some lot of photographs of him. And the postman said, no, nope, that one in the bill. And that was the first time I learned, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> we actually need a line in there that said, there can be a painting or there can be a photograph. And, uh, and, and so um, I guess that's a good point to pass the ball to the, the next team and, and, and the folks that, um, that um, worked with Congressman Hill to, to authorize the painting. But that's how that came about, which was the bill was just a very straight line. The facility of the United States Post Office Postal Service located at 70 and Main Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, shall be known and designated as the City of A. Jones Post Office Building, and there ought to be a painting there, but it didn't say that. So, <laughs> thank you all very much. from his staff here, AJ and Amelia Allard. Where are you two ladies? Way over there. So it's like, hi, to this lady. And I also noticed we have our local representative here, um, Denise Innitt, who is this in her district. Uh, I know you've had a few crazy days at the Capitol, so we appreciate that you're here. Are you all out of session officially yet? Okay. Yes, okay. <laughs> have another glass of wine. There you go. So at this point, I, I'm really honored to introduce our, our three distinguished speakers tonight. Wade Hampton. Yes. Okay, here we go. Wade is an artist. Birth within the state of mind, forged by Native Americans, blues and folk music, nine students, and evolved with an uptown mindset of concept, creation, and a make-it-happen attitude within the gateway to the world Wayne Hampton was provisioned with an inspiration that would lay claim to a unique journey of artist, artistic declaration. Mr. Hampton is an accomplished visual artist, 
dance performer, choreographer, and instructor, showcasing artwork in museums, galleries, and colleges, and performing and teaching at world-renowned dance events and festivals. For more information, you may visit wadehampton.com, and if you want to know how to salsa, here we go. <laughs> Colin Thompson. Colin has a studio art degree from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock and a master's in museum, museum science from Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. He has worked in the museum field in Colorado, Texas, New Mexico, Alabama, and as the art administrator of the Central Arkansas Library System for the last 13 years. Colin's oldest son recently graduated from Hendrix, and his younger son is enrolled at the University of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee, and he told me he is glad to be here. Thank you. John, John Perfoy Gill is a lifelong Arkansas resident with degrees in history and law from Vanderbilt University and a member of the Gill Reagan Owen Law Firm. He is past president of the Arkansas Bar Association, and in addition to over 50 years of law practice, his experience includes member of the Arkansas Parks, Recreation and Travel Commission, chairman of the Arkansas History Commission, president of the foundation that restored Little Rock's historic current hall, former co-chair, chairman of the Central Arkansas Civil War Heritage Trail Committee, and a committee chairman for the Louisiana Purchase Bicentennial. He was guest editor of the Centennial Edition of the Arkansas Lawyer, and his publications include On the Courthouse Square in Arkansas, Top Ten Cases in Arkansas History, The Crossroads of Arkansas, John Gill's Tour of Little Rock, Postmasters, Arkansas Post Office Art and the New Deal, Journal of the Survey of the Baseline of the Louisiana Purchase, and Open House, the history of the Arkansas Governor's Mansion. He's a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Marine Corps oh. Reserve. So, well, please join me in welcoming our speakers. So, I think we're going to start with John, and he's going to give us a little context with respect to public art and Scipio Jones. Thanks, Patricia. You knew it wore me out with all of that. <laughs> I'm going to try to pick up the pace now. I, uh, I told Vic Snyder a few minutes ago, he said, Vic, you started all of this. And it's amazing what it takes to pull something like this off. If I hadn't been for French Hill, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, getting an act of Congress to put a painting on a wall? <laughs> wow. A uh, great idea, but uh, getting it instrumentally fixed was a chore. Um, I had an awful lot of help doing this, and I have to say, to, well, that's all right. I just don't want to start something I can't finish. <laughs> I can't say enough about Carbo Hearn. Where did she go? <laughs> I've got a lot of heroes, but she's certainly one of them. All right. She pulled this off, and if it hadn't been for her input, we wouldn't have any portrait up there, at least of this portrait by this artist. It's been a joy working with her, and, uh, and with Colin, and all these other people that pitched in. Uh, it was a long haul, uh, but uh, we kind of have gotten to where we can sit back and look at the something to be proud of in Little Rock, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Vice President Hill, uh, okay, I, uh, you're the head of advancement for this institution. Boy, you all sure have advanced a lot since I was on the board of this place. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't look the same in lots of ways. But being on this campus again is a real thrill. Uh, it's a big part of Little Rock. The only thing I want you to do is get a door on the north end so you can get from downtown in here without uh, getting lost. That's another story I won't go into. <laughs> I was asked, uh, essentially, to speak on the um, conversation on public art. One of the books that Patricia mentioned is a book I wrote on all of the Arkansas post office art that was done here on the New Deal. And frankly, that's what got me interested in this project and in this portrait. 
Public art has graced the uh, Roman Forum and the uh, Boulevard of Paris for centuries. At the end of the First World War, Arkansas was a desert as far as public art was concerned. It was limited primarily to funerary art, which was a lot of, of uh, Victorian art and Civil War monuments. That was it. That was nothing like what we see today. I'll have to digress for a minute and say, don't categorize Civil War art just in one place. Probably uh, the most captivating work of art that I know about is a art that commemorates the Minnesota Union Army when it was here in, in Arkansas. And it, that, that piece of sculpture is a fact you ought to get on your to-do list. It's over at the National Cemetery. So, don't just categorize civil war art in, in, one, in one way. But, on with the story. Um, the New Deal changed our need for public art in a strange way. With the bank failures, chronic unemployment, hopelessness, beyond words, hunger, Franklin Roosevelt had to do something to get this country back on its feet and back confident in itself. So he turned to guess who? The First Lady. And Eleanor Roosevelt came up with the concept of using art in the U.S. post offices to send the message that America's okay mm. and its people are fine and we can survive this. So, growing out of that was the Department of Treasury's New Deal art program. The post office was chosen because nearly every person on that day went to the post office. Nearly every merchant started out to the post office to get the mail. And you had to go there to find out how your kid was doing in far off war. Mm. It was it was the place where everybody everybody uh, gathered around and everybody went to at least once a week, but usually once a day. It was the only federal presence that was there in throughout Arkansas. The only thing that everybody had from contact with the federal government was the post office. The term post office is a Roman desert uh, root from mean postus, which were the posts or stations that were put on the Roman roads. America followed that and created the post office and the post roads. So, what Alexander Hamilton said, a government continually at a distance and out of sight could hardly be expected to interest the sensations of the people the post office is what kept America at that time and still today in contact with its government. George Washington, in his inaugural address, talked about the value of the post office by saying it was an instrumentality of the diffusion of knowledge. And indeed it was. The work of the New Deal was, and Eleanor Roosevelt's words, the New Deal art program, was to lift the spirits of America. And that's what prompted this concept of a piece of art, a work of art, in this Little Rock Post Office. Essentially, it was to lift the spirits of the people of Arkansas. And when you know the story by which our hero came into that portrait, it's all the more amazing what a man he was, what a giant in the law. The, the work was managed by a fellow named Rowan in, in Washington, D.C. And feature this, you have a public art program managed by one man or a team of two in Washington, D.C. They set the tone. They counseled the artist. Everything that was done in the art from start to finish 
was managed by Washington, D.C. So don't talk about the government running things. They've been doing that for a long time. <laughs> and what they did um, was really manage the way this turned out. The artist submitted a preliminary sketch to be uh, of the proposed art, and the artists were selected nationwide. Only two artists from Arkansas did post office art in Arkansas. The rest of the people from you name it, all over the place. Most of the artists had never been in Arkansas. And a lot of them got their information by going to the New York Public Library and looking up what it looked like toward animals, and which featured a lot of them, or the rest of it. But the concept was still that you could manage art. Now, <laughs> where'd it happen standing back there? And I'm sure it's going, how in God's name do you ever paint with somebody in Washington, D.C. telling you <laughs> that you don't have your foot far enough into the picture, you need to change the stance of the subject. But that's how far the detail went. Eventually, it was uh, erected. There were 21 pieces of, uh, 10 or 21 works of art in Arkansas. 19 are still there. It's a great way to spend a day or a month or a week is to see that art that's still hanging in either post offices or former post offices uh, throughout the uh, state of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult today, even though we've had some pretty rough times here in the last few months, weeks, and years, but it's still very difficult to understand the Great Depression. The whole concept of, of, of helplessness now, we didn't have that as much here recently. The government stepped in a little quicker and did some things. But the whole concept of being alone and being without food and being helpless uh, is something that was entirely different for America. Most of the people were uneducated at that point, and most of them lost everything they had. My dad tells the story of driving from... Uh, uh, northern Oklahoma into Oklahoma City and losing everything he had in the car ride when the market crashed. I mean, that's kind of strong, folks. Uh, and it's hard to understand American life. And the concept was to turn to public art. And the government really, and this is the part I like particularly, created heroes out of ordinary people with the public art. There's a hero there that is commemorated in public art. It's the same concept that started back in the Depression. The government wanted a contemporary view of America in the post office so Americans would know it's going to get better and we're all right. And it worked. You'll have to say it worked. The art gave small town Arkansas a sense of identity and exposed Arkansasers to an image of themselves. One of the favorite stories that I found in researching this subject was for a fellow that had just seen the mural at uh, Pocahontas. And he told the postmaster, well, well, so that is art. If I had known it was so pretty, I sure would have to try to see something before. <laughs> but think about that, of what it did to create an interest, an interest in public art. So let's fast forward 100 years to the post office painting of Scipio Africanus Jones. It was created at a time of uncertainty. Two years ago, three years ago, definitely a time of uncertainty. It was created with the purpose of uplifting the spirits of the community of Little Rock, Arkansas. And letting people see themselves, or see people who are real, honest to God, living, at the time, heroes. And be able to, to touch, if you can't touch the portrait, but you can touch the glass. Yeah. Yeah, to stay in touch is really the word that I'm looking for. Humble people of this country should be impressed with the fact that the artist finds beauty and dignity in their life. And one of the many things we need to be taught in this country is that our lives 
however simple or humble, may be both beautiful and justified. Well, there you have it. There's the summary I've got of Cynthia Oak Jones' work. A man that appeared, a man that shared his resources. One of the stories about Scipio, most people don't know, he was a pretty wealthy man. He was a very, very, very successful lawyer. He drove a Cadillac with a chauffeur. He died almost broke because of what he did to defend these 12 unfairly charged men. And it wasn't just 12 folks, it was around 40 clients that he had. Most of them were on much less sentences and only 12 were sentenced to death on in the penitentiary. A quick word or two about the case that he inherited. Now, one of the things that any lawyer in the room will tell you, one of the things you don't want to do is to pick up a lawsuit that somebody else has tried, particularly somebody else has tried and lost. That's tough, tough work. I see a smile back there. You know what it's like, and most lawyers won't do it, uh, or at least do it with caution. So here's a man that had the job of defending, and I'm going to talk about just the 12. In a trial there one of the, where one of the jurors was on the posse that went out to arrest him. Where the defendants, every one of the defendants, met their defense counsel in the courtroom on the morning of trial for the first time. Most of the lawyers made no opening statements. One of the opening statements is, I look for a fair and impartial trial period. Friends, that's no opening statement at all. And none of the trials were concluded with lawyers giving the closing argument. The whole thing, and I'm not going to go into the rest of it because it really kind of makes me sick to talk about it. Having practiced law in this state for close to six decades, I don't like that history. It's a disgrace. And that's probably one of the reasons that we haven't brought this to the surface any sooner. It's so bad that you don't want anybody to know it. And you don't want anybody to know it happened in Arkansas. At least I didn't. So, the job was to find an artist who could capture this man and this element. His job was formidable. What I just said about what went wrong, you can say, well, I could beat that. No, you couldn't. The 14th Amendment the Constitution of the United States said that no state shall deprive any person of their liberty or property without due process of law. That has been on the books, it seems like, forever. But the Supreme Court of the United States ignored it time and time and time and time again. It limited those words to a property right. And you couldn't deny somebody's property, a butcher shop, for example, in the slaughterhouse cases, you couldn't deny that right because it was a property right protected by the Constitution. The Supreme Court never stepped up and protected individuals mm. under the Constitution. So, what did Scipio Jones do? Well, first of all, he had to overcome prejudice himself. And you'd be surprised where it came from. It came from the NAACP. They didn't like it. Here is a black lawyer in Little Rock, Arkansas, and we want a big time lawyer. Mm -hmm. yeah. We want a big time lawyer. And friends, I've been down that road a time or two. And people say, oh, well, we've got to get a New York lawyer for this. Well, usually they wish they hadn't. Uh, <laughs> in this case, he, he was asked really to step down by the general counsel of NAACP. Now, one of the things he did, of all things, was to hire a Confederate colonel, war hero, George Murphy, who was a fine white lawyer in Little Rock. And the two of them teamed up. Even though the powers that be and the NAACP was paying part of these expenses that didn't want him doing it, they said, well, we'll run it. We're here. We'll do it. And they divided the work. Jones interviewed the witnesses, reviewed the trial records, 
and wrote the briefs and put an asterisk around wrote the briefs because that's why the law got changed. I've been in a lot of oral arguments. Let me tell you, friends, it's what you wrote in the brief that's going to make the difference. You can look grand and stand up here and wave your hands. But the oral argument doesn't begin to compare with writing the brief and the petition. He did the lion's share of the legal work. Murphy was to speak to the press and be lead counsel. I don't have time to really divide how this thing went down. But it went down in large part because Sidney Hope Jones was one hell of a lawyer. Real quickly, he looked at the appeal and the, what were called the Ware defendants. That was six of these twelve. And lo and behold, the jury verdict wasn't part of the law. It violated the law. So we've got a new trial. Now, that wasn't a great victory because you have to go back to Helena, back to the white mob, back to the stack deck, and try again. But he did. I've always said that Sidney O. Jones is my hero because he'd walk into the jaws of hell for a client. And that's the lawyer's most important job. Mm. And he did it beautifully. He actually was able to get two white witnesses that had testified at the first trial to admit that they not had the testimony at the first trial was there were no beating, nobody got beaten. They admitted that witnesses were beaten to testify. Some of the defendants were beaten. And he got them, two of them, to change their testimony. And that was the linchpin that eventually freed these rare defendants. Wow. And he was so smart. The prosecutor wanted to keep trying, wanted, wanted to try that case, but he kept putting it off because he couldn't find anybody to turn it around on what these witnesses had said. So every time it came time for trial, the prosecutor would say, I want to continue this. Now, you have to be a lawyer to fully understand this or appreciate this, but Scipio Jones did not say, I object. He said, we're ready for trial. Yeah. Well, if he had said, I object, they would have had to have a hearing and probably would have ended up having a trial. Yeah. But he did that so many times that under the law, if you don't put them uh, to court, if you don't try them, and they've been in jail for over two years, they're free. And he freed those six on that. Yeah. Six. The other six were free because of what Jones did in writing the law, writing the briefs that changed the law in America forever, saying that the federal court system could review on what's called habeas corpus any state criminal case. That is so huge that it turned American jurisprudence completely on its ear. It's a concept that is so common now, everybody knows about it, but it wasn't very common then. Well, these defendants were ultimately all set free. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, art can lift the spirits of America. And when I see that painting that Wade did, it lifts my spirits. I hope it'll lift yours. I appreciate you letting me say, I warned Patricia this wasn't going to be a quick fix. <laughs> but I appreciate your patience. All right.
I don't think, you know, at least in my lifetime, that I'll fully come to understand the significance when you go to congress.gov, when you actually see the, uh, the formality forms that have been signed by the enacting president, you know, and your name is written in as, written into history, as, into the U.S. Constitutional law, the person who's assigned to the papers before you. I don't think it's going to, it hasn't soaked in yet. Uh, so this is, it's like a huge amount of what I haven't even seen yet. But, so, um, very humble, very thankful I've been helping to uh, contribute a part of, to a part of uh, CPO's legacy. So, we're going to go ahead and jump into the slideshow. This is a brief narration, uh, CTO of Kenneth Jones, a narration by Wade Hampton. Okay. All right, so first I want to recognize, this is actually the program um, that was um, made for the naming of the post office. Um, and so and obviously a large part of that that was championed was by uh, Representative uh, Big Snyder. So um, without that, um, this project would not have happened at the point when it did. So I just wanted to make that, let that be known. So I'm going to quickly head to, and if you can see on the large screen, uh, just highlighting uh, a number of others, but highlighting uh, the person that really pushed this forward. So uh, that was 2007. Um, it was renamed uh, in Scipio A. Jones Post Office Station. Uh, so, and this is a picture that I took. Um, it, was, it was back in 2017. I think it was early summer or late spring. Um, I actually dropped it called me before I was out west. When I made it back in town, she was like, let's take a little field trip. You know, I, think I want you to see something. Why don't you look at this wall? So, I'm like, okay, blank wall, okay. So, <laughs> but I can make something out of that. So we went down to, this is literally when I got out of her car, and I think on the surface, on the surface, you know, yeah, so what? I'm, I'm, I'm a parent, you know. I'm, uh, people have heard that, that I dance, so. But the primary thing is that I see myself as documenting my path, you know. What's my journey? It just happens to be, yeah, I, can, I can write in this form, this visual art form, or I can write in this sort of moving content form. But I'm always seeing compositions, I'm always seeing colors. Um, some people become strange and crazy, but I'm always just snapping, documenting, and so I just captioned this when I first got out of, the, out of our car, and I just had it in the back of my head since then. So we walked in, and if those of you remember this before, um, the wall was pretty much blank. I don't know, I can't recall if anything else was there but prior, but this was when I walked in, we walked in that morning, that late morning. And so obviously, uh, Governor Hearn had briefed me on the project earlier over the phone, and a person that, uh, there was a, an attorney that was looking to have a portrait, an artwork, uh, put together for the post office. So uh, we're going to go through a process of selecting. And so um, later on that year, uh, end of 2017, December, we had a meeting at Powwow. And well, yeah, going back to, of course, it's the man, Sidney Ralph Kenneth Jones. The man, the myth, the legend. And so this is actually the image that I, after a large amount of research of trying to figure out what this person looked like, trying to culminate, you know, his, his, his whole figure, his whole body, uh, his personality, this was the primary image that stayed in my mind. So uh, we're going to flip on to the next. And as these were represented as the Elaine 12. And so, um, I just want to read the names that are named out of your mind. So, obviously, these were the men that were on trial, um, but obviously, they represent a number of others that were in that town that day of those few weeks. We have Ed Hicks, Ed Coleman, Ed Ware, Frank Moore, Paul Hall, <coughs> Albert Giles, Joe Knox, Frank Hicks, Joe Fox, Alfred Banks Jr., John Martin. William Wardlow. So, just had to give that a moment. So that was, um, after seeing that image and sort of doing as much research as I can in regards to who is this person about, I, I, up until that point, I'd never heard about it. And I even asked some of my, some of my, my, um, some of my friends, I even found out even within the, even within the lane, even within the, the the then town of Hoopsburg, even within the Dunbar district, there were people that were not even aware of this whole moment that took place. So I was like, it's so many moments, and this happens to be one of them. You know, a huge one. As, you know, as John, John Gill reflected back to the 14th Amendment, how that applied to that point, and how we hear about that today, the due process of law. So, uh, yeah, so these, these images I captured in mind, I compiled a lot of images, did a lot of research. 
we're going to move on. So this is what I presented that day. And I think when uh, I presented this on my, on, my, um, on my tablet, and myself, Margo, and John Gill were all sitting down at the Prima uh, bookstore, and this is the image that I fashioned. And that piece is actually one of my other pieces, which is actually hanging at the Saracen Casino in Mount Bluff. That is a life-size portrait of yours truly. So, but I use that to sort of emphasize the layout of what this piece could be, what it could look like. So, superimpose onto the photograph of the post office. This is what we may have. So, and it turned out we all sort of agreed on this and we went along to the next step. And the next phase, this is the sketch. And actually I have the actual sketch right here. And this is an 18 by 24 piece. Some of you may be able to see it on the screen, but I also wanted to get the actual piece here. <clears throat> this is a real tangible, this is a live piece here. And obviously what most of our work is known for is um, society portraiture. Um, some of you may be aware of these painters, John T. Sargent, Edgar Degas, uh, go back a few years to Diego Velasquez, a few more years back to Rembrandt. Uh, those are my four, those are like my Mount Rush board. There are, there are a number of others you know, within that. There's Frank Dubinet, a number of, uh, a number of impressions painters, a number of drawers. Um, those are the guys I look at in regards to how can I perfect my craft as a technician, as an architect, as a draftsman, you know, to paint. So, um, so that my, primarily my work was um, in a traditional portrait of sense, but with this piece, uh, once Rob had briefed me on more information on this piece, I almost instinctively had a, had a thought in my mind. It's like, okay, there was a there was a, um, a massacre, uh, there was a call to trial, and there was a decision. So I wanted to capture that moment after the decision was made. So how do you capture that moment? I wasn't quite sure. I just these things just popped in my head. So I was thinking. Okay, I wanted to hold the full figure, and I wanted him walking. I wanted him maybe sort of out, outdoors if you step out and sort of take a breath. And I wanted to relate back to, you know, the, the case that made, we have this big building symbolizing the courthouse. And so, uh, this piece was, this is actually done in a very sort of illustrative manner. A little more of a storytelling. Slightly off that from the traditional portrait style, but we have Scipio sort of walking out, walking down the stairs, and it's just after the decision. And so I'm going to go ahead, you can sort of go back and forth to the sketch there and the slides as we go forward. And I want to, um, so this, this piece, this watercolor sketch was presented to, uh, was done in completion, it was presented to Garble, um, John Gill, and also to Colin Thompson. And we all pretty much came to an agreement. Okay, I think we may be able to move forward and see what might be able to happen. And so from that point, I think uh, Attorney John Gill had presented to French Hill's team and so, from that stage, it was, I think he started the committee proposal on, it was June of 2019. And from that point, you know, over the next few years, there was a process of this had to be passed through the House, this had to be passed through the Senate. And there was a lot of empty, you know, in my mind, like sort of empty space in there as Garber and I would sort of reconvene on various projects and sort of mention. Yet it's still in progress, as, as I remember John Gill and, and Garber would sort of be in touch and sort of touch bases every now and then. So over a few years, passed through the House, passed through the Senate, and as of December 3rd, 2020, um, this proposal, this bill proposal, was passed into an official U.S. law, which is the U.S. Bill HR 3317, Public Law 116-198. Mm -hmm. So you can look it up, and it's all there, and I'm going to click on to the next piece. And so this is actually the formality. Um, once after the program, you can, well, you can see it, but it's actually the formality that was signed by then acting President Trump, who was signed it into an official U.S. law. So uh, yes, and so it uh, states it pretty much allows for the, um, the post the postmaster to give permission uh, for an artwork to display. Uh, that being the work painted by the artist Wade Hamilton. So. And so now we're going to move to the, so yes, that's on a sheet of paper, that's, that's signed by the then acting president. But if you, once again, if you go to the conference.gov, and you can go to it uh, later tonight, uh, this weekend, and you can read all of it in detail, the steps in the process and everything. And there, uh, at the bottom, is, uh, was truly that name right there. So, um, yeah, so now we're going to fast forward slightly. Um, so once that was pretty much signed and approved, then we could sort of kick it into the next phase. And so we're going to fast forward to 
Yeah, that's, uh, that's that guy in the studio on the dance floor. And there I am sort of measuring out the canvas roll, uh, the prime canvas. And I'm going to quickly sort of go through the process. Uh, so a number of artists, they usually, they'll commission other, uh, they'll contract others to sort of construct their canvases. You know, I wanted to be, as much as I could, I wanted to be a part of this process. You know, I wanted to, this is not traditionally what a painter would do, but um, I'm a little bit more tangible, I like to get more involved, and so my thing was to, I, I want to make, I want to feel this, this canvas, I wanted to, as, besides researching the story, I wanted to sort of involve myself into much of the, as much of the process as possible. So, um, stretching a canvas, for those of you that may have any familiarity with, with art, visual artwork, stretching a small canvas, you have a life-size piece, uh, it's not for the painted heart. So. <laughs> so we're going to move forward, and so then we skip forward, and that's me in my studio, standing on the podium, and there I am toting the canvas. It is, it stands tall at seven and a half feet tall by six and a half feet wide. It is a life-size piece. You can go to the post office um, in your leisure. And Sidney, I, I believe he measured at five feet, maybe three or four inches. So it's roughly pretty much close to proportion size. So we're going to click forward. And there we have, you can see the sketch towards the upper left, the watercolor sketch, and multimedia sketch next to the actual painting. And so I use that as reference. So I use some other drawings that I've done, other research, and I was going back and forth. And so all this was done, the sketching, yeah, it's, it's, it was all done freehand, uh, believe it or not. So, which even with artists is like, wow, you did that freehand. But it's just a matter of how you want to perfect your craft, your, your skill, uh, your passion. And so as we move forward, there is the canvas with some paint on it. We cover it up. And as we move forward, there's a little bit more. Okay, and now you can sort of see it in relation to the sketch right there, and in the studio. And this is a whole other thing. Within the this this large piece within this small studio was a whole other story within the story. So um, that was something else. And so now we're going to move forward to some of the details. And so this is pretty much in its near completed stage. And we have a detail of the umbrella. Uh, why was he holding an umbrella? Um, an umbrella besides, you know, it was a sunny day. Why you can use white and have it? These are all symbolic pieces, as it, as it symbolizes a, a form of, of protection and coverage. And mm. so, as we move forward, there is the briefcase. The briefcase symbolizing everything that eventually led to the freeing of those uh, sheriff offers. So, um, and as we move forward to the time piece. So, and there was, I, I chose that, this is part of the, that, the attire of that period. And so I wanted to have that timepiece try at 3 o'clock. That, in a sense, felt to me like, okay, it's the afternoon. It's pretty much after the day's cases have closed. Yeah. And it's also just a sense of, it's, it's within so many connotations and religious connotations, it's, it's 3 p.m., you know. So I felt that was a strong, uh, strong piece of this, um, of this narration. And so we're going to move forward. And there we have the, the scales. The, Justice of law, and so if that if there's anything that was sort of carry it through what type of building was he walking out of, I felt as small as that was, which is just to next to the door, that it really provided symbolism. Hey, this is the courthouse. So I wanted to provide a little bit of indication, but not too much. And then we go to why am I zeroing in on on the fencing? Um, well, because this is you know a large part of the research where. I'm still sort of curious about, so I, I was curious, you know, I, I don't know anyone, you know, that has any Scipio Africanus Jones, you know, Scipio Africanus. So I did a little bit of research, not much, and it finds out he was named after Scipio Africanus, the Roman general. And so during that times, during those times, um, wrought iron, the material, was used as a weaponry. But as today, it's used as decorative elements, um, landscaping, outdoors, and sometimes inside the homes. So I felt that was a, a subtle but sort of substantial way to sort of add, keep that in there and sort of bring that sort of back to present day. So, um, yes, Scipio Africanus Jones, Scipio Africanus the Roman general, they are both pragmatic thinkers. They had a linear way of thinking. So I really emphasize the linear molding of the building. And this is, when you see the piece in its entirety in person, you'll see how Scipio is sort of crowned or sort of framed by the window, almost like in, in a sun sort of way. Sort of a sense of protection. So, and then, so, we'll see the, the, the finished piece soon. So now we move to, as once again, my involvement was within that, that, this, um, that week of February, it entailed 
Um, on February 19th, there was a history day at the Sue Collins Library, which was followed by the unveiling on the 24th, and then followed by the meet and greet at Hearn Fine Art on the 26th. Okay? And so, as we go through here, this is, um, I'm just going to name out these people because they're very integral, very important to putting this history day together. You know, where would we be without history? So, um, Wesley Peters, um, the moderator for the event, okay, Sue Collins Library, and yes, she is here today, ladies and gentlemen. The <laughs> <laughs> Park Historic Neighborhood Association, she's a representative for that, and so all of these people that I continue to read them out were very important in putting all this together and continuing recognition of so many things that are happening today. And so we have Dr. Oba L. Lagoye, he's a Scipio Africanus Jones historian. So if you ever get a chance to meet with him, a uh, very knowledgeable man, very humble man. He has a lot of things, a lot of information on Scipio and many other things. And so we have Toya Stewart, who is the Horseman Archive Development Foundation representative. So her and Wesley are part of the team that are actually funding the project to restore Scipio's home. Okay? And so they're very, very important people. And Lisa Gilbert. She's one of the descendants, the actual descendants of mm. the Lane Massacre. So I didn't have a chance to speak for that day, but it was nice to briefly introduce ourselves. And we have Dr. Brian Mitchell, who um, has an enormous amount of history on the Lane Massacre and a great historian. Okay. And Kara Connors, she was um, a recently elected judge. Um, she's a part of the Black Attorneys in Arkansas Association. I actually met her husband that day at the unveiling on the 24th. Um, very beautiful people. And there he is. This gentleman is here. He's live and direct. He's front row, Mr. Colin Thompson, the <laughs> representative of the Central Arkansas Library System. Um, very important figure, very humble man. There off in the background, there is a, there's that guy. <laughs> so give me a few words. So that was the um, CPO African Jones History Day. And so we're going to fast forward to the transportation of the work. This work was um, transported to from my West, West uh, Coast studio to the Hearn Fine Art Auction House, and it was housed there up until uh, several meetings that followed with the client, uh, John Gill, Colin Thompson, and Representative French Shield. And so this is on the day of the transportation of the piece. Okay? And then, by the way, this piece was transported by Brad Norris of Norris Quality Furniture. For those of you that are looking to have your items moved in a care and gentle way. <laughs> Norris Paul, I'm, I'm going to call them, I'm, I'm, I'm giving them their due. I'm giving them their due. They brought this piece to the post office, unscathed. It's hanging. We're here today. Give them their due. Okay? So, all right. And so there we go. We're bringing in the plexiglass sheet. And also, barrier installers, hot as glass. You know, these are, these are the behind the scenes people. And if you've ever performed on stage, actually, quick story, I, I did some performances with Cirque du Soleil. So, the world-renowned uh, dance company, stage dance company, a third of the, the acting is, a third of the performance is on stage, two-thirds is behind stage. If you've ever been behind stage, these are the behind stage, behind the scenes people. So, um, I want you to recognize them. And so there it is, once it's hanging, once it's draped. Okay, and there we go, that's the day of, the morning of. And there is the post office that is Representative French Shield. There are a number of people there speaking, uh, a number of people that have represented many facets of putting this all together. And here we go. Here is a close up, and there it is as it hangs on the wall. It is once again seven and a half feet by six and a half feet. And I Within society portrait, within art terms, uh, grand manner style, um, life size portraiture. And so, once you see this, once you walk in, you really, you literally get pulled into. You want, you almost want to walk up the stairs into. You want to go. Where is he walking to? He's actually walking. He's going down the stairs. The decision was made, and he's turning to his right, walking west. Mm -hmm. This whole thing about well, let's go to the lobby, and then there's a hallway that goes out to the PO box. And so it has a sort of Reality play. For those of you that are aware of Diego Velasquez, his, his piece, Las Meninas, which is at the Prado Museum uh, in Spain, it deals with different realities, different mirrors, different hallways, and things like that. So all of these things sort of come back to play. And so now you can see the piece as a whole as it comes together, the columns, 
the structure, how it implies back to Roman times, ancient times. And so, yeah, this is a very, um, it's a very daunting piece. Uh, so we wanted to flip forward, and that was a little bit of media. And there we are. There's a uh, part of the cast and crew. Uh, John Gill, <laughs> Rich Hill, yours truly, and Garbo Hearn. Okay. And I know, um, can you just stop for a moment? Please give this lady a round of applause, please. <laughs> Current fine art. It's not just a gallery. It's not just a bookstore. It's not just a frame shop. There are each one within our own, but they're all together. There are so many things that take take place there. There are interviews. There are our um, preservation talks. There are so many things that, that you know I've crossed paths. Actually, that's where I met Andrew Burke first. So um, it's, it's an institution within its own right. Yes. Um, right at the corner of Wright and Chester. So yes. if you have not been there, please go pick up a book. <laughs> so, go, get it, go get it framed, you know. So, um, like Garbo Hearn of Prime Fine Art, um, this lady has been a very, a very important figure within, not only within art, art history, but, but you know, this, she has her place. This institution has its place. So, thank you, Garbo. So. And this is Etoya Nelson. Senior of Community Electric, this gentleman and his company were responsible for putting up the lights and the system. Yes, so what? I painted. These are the people that help put it together. These are the behind the scenes people. If you understand the logistics of things, why things get put in place, you know, you'll be blown, you'll, your mind will be blown into infinity. So, once again, I'm thanking these people because they deserve it. Okay? And there we go, there's a little bit of media. And there he is, Mr. Colin Thompson, along with John Gill, and yours truly. Hey, gotta get my brothers in there. <laughs> I have to, I have to. So my brother Carl, young brother Jerome, so we fought, wrestled, agreed, disagreed, but they were there, we take it then, you know, the life, baby, the life. So, and then Saturday, that two days later, was the meet and greet artist day. So that comprised of a get to know the artist. You know, meet and greet. When, when events are held at Current Fine Art, it, it's not just one dimensional, there's so many facets. So, Get to know, meet and greet. There was a slideshow. I went through my process, showed a few more slides, and then there was an artwork tour of my work from the gallery into the auction house. Okay? And there I am, sort of jibbering and jabbering, doing what I do. So, okay, there's Mr. Magnum right there. <laughs> okay, this, yeah, this is the plaque. This is the bio on Sipio Arcadis Jones, and there is the nameplate beneath. So that is to the right of the post office when you walk in. Now let's sort of bring this back full circle. 2007. Thank you, Representative Fitch Snyder. Thank you. So without that, then this would not have happened then. And so at any moment, um, if you're unable to make it inside the lobby, um, you can drive by during after hours, day or night, and you can view it from afar. So um, very good placement. And yes. So I believe that is... Okay, so this is, um, throughout this process, once again, I've mentioned that I just happen to paint. You know, some of you have heard that I just happen to dance, but it, it's, you know, I've been documenting my path, whether it's a smartphone, whether it's mirrorless cameras now. So within that, you know, this was a year and a half years ago, so when we were deep into that, that you know, that new, that, that current stage of, of the world, what was happening, you know, I didn't want to allow anyone to my studio, so I invested in some equipment, and I started documenting the whole process from stretching the canvas, to putting the canvas together, to painting the canvas. And so within that, I was like, let me just document, let me just get it on film. So with all that compiled, and as I learned more and more about who this person is, and what happened, what took place in, in American history, and just met so many people, you know, um, I thought, at some point, somehow, I've got to compile this into some type of documentary. You know, so at least more so, obviously, with, with the focus of being from the painter's point of perspective, but compiling everything together. So, here's a preview of what's to come, okay? So, I'm going to go ahead and let this play. Actually, I hopefully I have the volume up. I'm going to let the volume up.
So within one form of creation, just by wanting to capture and document, my mind, body, spirit, and thought has been pulled into moving content. So, you know, if I thought painting this was something, wow, you know, a whole lot of respect for videographers, but this will happen, this will happen. And so, as we segue, someone, um, Patricia had mentioned, um, i given a little brief synopsis of my bio. Yes, I am a dancer, specifically salsa, specifically New York style salsa, specifically termed it as mambo. So, um, to segue into the next part of, okay, why, what is he talking about? Why does he paint the way he, why does he paint the way he do? Well, part of the way I paint, part of the attraction of, if there's any attraction to what I do, half of that is through dance performance. So, um, a treat for all of you, for all of you that are here in town, if you are here in town, if you're here in town tomorrow, I will be performing at the <laughs> Presidential Clinton Library. <laughs> <laughs> As that painting, as it's been talked about, as you may appear to appreciate it, it's a whole other facet to see the person who executed that actually performing on the dance stage. This event, um, Arkansas United, for those of you who have not heard of this, this organization, they're an immigrant resource and advocacy group. They're based in Springdale, Arkansas. They have an office in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so tomorrow they are celebrating their 10-year anniversary. Yep. All right. <laughs> 10 years and going strong, 10 years and 10,000 more. And they're celebrating it at the Presidential Clinton Library. Uh, the executive director is actually here, live in person. And so for those of you that are interested in attending, that are interested in sort of seeing, can this guy dance? Can he move a foot or not? So I'll prove you wrong, and I'll do it. So I just want you all to join us tomorrow night at the Arkansas United 10th Anniversary Gala at the President Clinton, President Clinton Presidential Library. And it's also at 5.30. And so I believe that um, that concludes my little part. I could go on for hours, but we're not going to have that. Thank all of you. Thank all of you very, very much.
mansion in New York, working in Las Vegas. I mean, uh, Mr. Hampton's a very busy man, so. But you did it. You did it. We did it. Very, very uh, pleased that this is now part of the central part of the collection of the Central Arkansas Library System. So I would invite everyone to go down to the post office and take a look at that. All right. Yeah, that's right. 